This is Steph Guthrie, a feminist activist in Toronto. And this is Gregory Ellen Elliott, a graphic artist by trade and a father of four, also based in Toronto. In 2012, Ms. Guthrie went to Toronto police and accused Mr. Elliott of criminally harassing her and two other women over Twitter. An investigation was undertaken. What was uncovered was interesting. Elliot and Guthrie had originally met in friendship and collaboration. Guthrie is the founder of an organization called Witopoli, Women in Toronto Politics, whose mandate is to encourage and facilitate women's influence in the pol political sphere. Elliot, being a believer in women's equality and empowerment, offered to design and create a prom promotional poster for the organization, free of charge. Sounds like a match made in heaven. A liberal man, willing, even eager, to give free stuff to a feminist woman to help her promote women's political empowerment. So, where did things go wrong? How did it come to this? An investigation and prosecution of this progressive fellow on charges of criminal harassment of women. Was Mr. Elliot a creeper? Was he infatuated with the much younger Ms. Guthrie? Did she reject his advances and suffer a campaign of intimidation and threats in return? What gives? Well, Mr. Elliot was guilty of that most grievous and abominable of sins. He disagreed with a feminist. Publicly. Persistently. Sometimes impolitely. And when he was told by that feminist to cease speaking altogether, he declined. And what was it that Mr. Elliot disagreed with Miss Guthrie about? Well, it was about a man named Ben Spur in a game app called Beat Up Anita Sarkeesian. You see, Ben Spur was irked by Sarkeesian's Jack Thompson-esque assertions that video games train men to be violent misogynists. He engaged in an age-old tradition of either creating game apps that allow players to take their frustrations out on a despised figure, or hacking said despised figure into an ultraviolet game. In other words, he gave Anita Sarkeesian the Jack Thompson treatment and he included a six-page preface explaining why he had created the game. That brutal, often random violence against men in video games is so routine that a critic like Sarkeesian standing on a pile of virtual dead men complaining about misogynistic game tropes that promote violence against women is, well, in a word, feminists seem to have made trendy over the last year or two, risible. Apparently, everyone who mattered skipped those pages and the proverbial shit hit the fan. The game app was short-lived, being pulled almost immediately from sites where it was hosted for download after the publishing of dozens of articles condemning it for misogyny and anti-woman violence. But things weren't over for Mr. Spur, and they were just beginning for Mr. Elliot. Ben Spur lives in Ontario, and Ms. Guthrie saw it as her moral and civic duty to crush him like the misogynistic cockroach he obviously was. She and her friends tweeted furiously at every company that did or might ever have a use for Mr. Spur's talents, warning them not to hire the leper. Guthrie mused later in a TEDx talk that she debated with herself vigorously over whether she should sick the internet on Mr. Spur, a debate Mr. Spur unfortunately lost. Understanding full well the scope of her reach on social media, Ms. Guthrie incited a mob of tw feminist Twitterites to bombard the man with hateful messages. She and her friends even publicly discussed a poster campaign in Spur's hometown, outing him as a violence-promoting misogynist. Now, Mr. Elliot watched all of this go down, bemused at first, and then he dared to speak up. Ms. Guthrie's behavior, he claimed, was no more moral or righteous than the game Spur had created. He disagreed not with her feelings, but with her actions and that was his first mistake. His second mistake was to continue talking about Ms. Guthrie, a public figure, remember, and her actions, even after Ms. Guthrie and her compatriots blocked him on Twitter. Indeed, if Guthrie, a public figure, was harassed by Mr. Elliot, it was not because he was directing any invective or disapproval in her direction, but because she and her friends went looking for it. They had to go looking for it. Mr. Elliot was blocked. A detailed investigation by police 
found no indication of anything threatening or harassing in any of Mr. Elliott's tweets to the three women. But under Canadian law, criminal harassment is subjective. It's based partly on the objective actions of the accused harasser and partly on the subjective feelings of the victim. Ms. Guthrie and her two friends reported to police that they felt endangered by Mr. Elliott's disagreement with their behavior and tactics. During the course of the trial, an investigation based on an alleged witness's letter to the judge was initiated to ascertain whether, in fact, the women had conspired to abuse the criminal justice system to punish Mr. Elliott for his inconvenient opinions and make an example out of him. Endangered? I think not. These women, Guthrie at the helm, have perpetrated multiple campaigns of internet bullying and harassment against people they don't like. Guthrie wasn't afraid for herself when she outed Mr. Spur. On the contrary, from her TEDx talk, she fully understood the enormous power she had to destroy him on a whim. And she wasn't afraid Mr. Elliot would harm her either. From her demeanor on the witness stand, she seems like a megalomaniacal psychopath with delusions of infallibility and invulnerability. She just wanted him to shut up, because his opinion of her actions made her look bad. And so, here we are. Closing arguments have been rendered, the case has been adjourned, and a verdict is scheduled for October 6th. And as the headline of Christy Blatchford's latest National Post article on the case reads, ruling in Twitter harassment trial could have enormous fallout for free speech. Maybe I should just like move to the States.